I suggest uh, we start it, uh, our session. Please use your earphone. Are you get some of my voice? Please uh, raise your hands. Okay. Thank you. Now, we are starting our morning session. Mobile is changing the world, challenge and uh, opportunities are paired for enterprises. My name is Gao Xingming from China. I'm in charge of the Vice Chairman of the Internet Society of, of China. Today, as you know, the mobile internet is most uh, hot post of the internet cycle. In recent years, the internet, uh, mobile internet is growing very fast, including China and other developing countries. Today, workshop, we will invite several speakers to discuss and uh, present the development of the mobile internet and discuss all the issues mobile internet related. Today morning session, we have uh, five speakers we invited. Uh, I suppose uh, the, for every speaker, uh, I ask them maybe to present uh, for uh, 10 minutes. Afterwards, I will open floor for comments and the discussion. Then, after all the speakers present their uh, contents, I invite the remote participants to uh, raise their questions and uh, their comments. So, may, may we start it uh, from a uh, first speaker. I would uh, invite Mr. Uh, Mr. Liu. Uh, Liu Ziyong uh, from China Telecom. Uh, maybe before their presentation, I'll ask uh, every speaker introduce themselves afterwards start their presentation. Now I open floor for Mr. Liu, please. Hello, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Liu Zhiyong. I'm from China Telecom. Uh, I'm the deputy managing director of the government and enterprise customer department of China Telecom, and also the GM of China Telecom System Integration Corporation. Uh, my topic My topic today is about how the China Telecom deal with the mobile internet development. My topic will be divided into three parts. The first part is status and the trends, and the second part is our strategies of China Telecom. The, the last one is our China Telecom's business development. As we, we can see, the global mobile communication grows very rapidly. And also in China, we can see that by the September of the 2012, the number of the 3G subscribers in China exceeded 200 million. And a uh, very important things I have to mention here is in September this month, the last month, in fact, China's new 3G subscribers exceeded 10 million in, prom in one month. This is a very important point. 
and uh, the Chan Telecom, our mobile subscribers also increase very rapidly. Our increase year to year is 43.2% for our mobile service revenue and our mobile data revenue also increased 66, uh, 46.7 year to year. And also we can see the mobile service keep a uh, very well growth. Our mobile subscribers in half of this year is we can see the, the, the our market mob, mobile market share is thirteen point eight percent, but the speed transfer from two G to three G become a very robust growth. Our three G subscriber now is fifty point six nine million, and the 3G, 3G mobile users add the traffic per the average traffic per 3G handset use per month is 111 megabit. So we can see that with uh, the hand with the intelligent handset become more popular, the data traffic increase very rapidly for each year for each year so we can we can see that thanks to the enrich enrichment of the 3G yeah thanks to enrichment of the 3G smart devices and the mobile internet applications the end user are gradually a customer to the 3G services and which also accelerated the transferring from 2G to 3G. In, in China Telecom, we develop a lot of services and we can also see that the service and technologies are increasingly rich and mature. We have developed a lot of service, especially after 2012, we introduced a lot of the 3G services. And also the future technology trend also become more obvious, such as the LBS services, the multi-screen interaction, all this we think will be uh, strong, put a strong energy in the development of the mobile services. The future of the mobile internet, we think, is the solo mode. Yeah. The social plus local and plus mobile. We base a lot of application on that technology. Another very rapid develop, uh, get very rapid development service is e-commerce. We expected that after the 2012 year, the e-commerce in mobile will exceeded 50, 57% and it will increase every year afterwards. Another thing we should see and also our China Telecom stick to is our open platform. We introduce the open platform and we get a lot of cooperation with various kind of service provider such as the Baidu, Titan, Tentas, and Amazon, Yahoo, etc. One more thing I should mention is that the different expert and expertise in internet in enterprise and car carriers 
are quite different. We think the values, the passion, the innovation, learning and execution is their value is different from our traditional operators, such as our value. Normally, we stick to the balance and steady development, workflow-driven. All these things we think is quite different. The second part I will introduce is our strategy of China Telecom on the mobile internet. About China Telecom, I just uh, give you a, a very brief review. Uh, by the end of 2012, we have 600, uh, we have 670,000 employees. And by the end of 2011, the China Telecom owns our fixed line is 175 million. Our mobile phone is 123 million. Our wireline broadband is 85 million. Our recognition awards is we are the most world most admired enterprise. The best company in, China, uh, in telecommunication business. Our, our revenue also increased each year, especially after we introduced CDMA network in 2008. You can see from this slide our mobile subscribers changed 17.7. In fact, it increased. Also, by the end of this, this month, our broadband internet will exceed 10,000 million. Our revenue breakdown, you can see, the mobile, mobile data, mobile revenue is, is more than 45, 54,000 uh, 54, million RMB. But the changes is great. It changed 43.2 increase. So half of the, our revenue now China Telecom are from our mobile service. The internet economic enables New Europe for carriers. We really expected that. We think the, the carrier, the China Telecom, we can play a very important role in the development of the mobile internet because we have the user data, we have the corporate network and the match re requirement and the supply. And also we develop the unified user data platform for external cooperation, intelligent matching between requirement and the supply. In fact, our strategy on the mobile internet can be, can be divided into three parts. First, we see the handset convergences. We can utilize, leverage our fixed network and mobile network. We can get the fixed phone, PC, TV, PDA, and the mobile handset interacted with each other. And also we get the network convergences. We convert our fixed LAN and wireless LAN and also the mobile network. We also get the service convergences. We, we develop the content and application to the customers, such as the games, VOD, home information. And also we develop a lot, lot of applications and solutions to the enterprise, such as IPVPN, system integration, IT outsourcing, etc. 
China Telecom fully engaged in the mobile internet services three through through three steps. The first step, we purchased the CDA CDMA network from Unicom, the China and other operators. The second step introduced our e-surfing, introduced 3G e-video services through, uh, from 2000, uh, two, uh, 2009 years. The third one, the third step, we, pro we provide a lot of internet things, a lot of internet applications. So in the, in the age of the mobile internet, we really recognize that the cooperation is very important. From this side, you can see that we cooperate with a lot of the worldwide service providers to introduce in our network. And also, China Telecom initiated the Open Mobile Internet Alliance partnering with other related companies to facilitate the development of the whole industry. So our Open Mobile Internet Alliance is a volunteer-formed and non-profit organization. In order to facilitate the cooperation, we, we built a mobile internet service platform in order to effectively cooperate with other provider services, we can we can introduce our data, uh, our our users, our our bidding system, our service management platform, in order to facilitate the process of the cooperation. So the last one is last part of my topic is business development, as I mentioned before. We really focus our mobile internet application from two parts. One is for the individual application, mostly focused to the consumers. The second part is our enterprise applications focused on the local government and livelihood. For the consumers, we have eight, we have introduced eight services, such as the e-store, uh, something like uh, the, uh, the application store, the e-readers, the e-game, the i-music, i-animation, and the best tone services. All these kind of services are introduced to our handset, used especially for our smartphone handset. And another uh, mobile internet application is for the government enterprises. We introduce the video management, the e-school, e-learning, environment monitoring, and e-logistics, and e-work. I think all these applications are very attractive to our government and to our enterprise. So in summary, our China Telecom to deal with the opportunities and challenges in the era of the mobile internet, we see a lot of opportunities and also we see the challenges. So how we can grasp the opportunities instead of meet a lot of challenges, we, we, we deal it with three parts. The first from commercial level, we, we introduce application convergence platform. On the application level, we develop unique application for the mobile internet. And from strategic level, we identify the advantages, positioning in the industry chain, and organize our internal reforms. So we think in the with the more and more mobile internet service introduced, China Telecom will, will become more and more, uh, more and more robust in revenue growth, and we can meet more and more applications in the society in China Telecom 
social society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Liu. Uh, as you know, the China Telecom is the biggest, uh, it used to be the biggest uh, fixed line operator in China. Uh, since uh, 2000, maybe 2009, uh, 2009 uh, China Telecom gets uh, the license to operate a mobile, uh, a mobile uh, service. And uh, uh, as uh, Mr. Liu said, the pa in past uh, two or three years, is the mobile internet users also developed very rapidly. Uh, the subscriber, mobile subscriber for telecom, for China Telecom, are over uh, 100, 120 million uh, subscribers. And among those, maybe uh, 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 20 or 60 percent is uh, 3G uh, subs subscribers. So the, I think, uh, very successful operation. So I thanks again, uh, uh, Mr. Liu, for your excellent uh, presentation. Uh, if you have some uh, questions or comments, I suppose uh, we will later, you, you can uh, uh, remain your right. Then I want, ask a second speaker uh, from Cisco is uh, uh, yes <laughs> sorry uh, Dr. Hossein uh, Dr. Hossein Badran uh, Dr. Hossein is, uh, is come from uh, uh, Cisco uh, he is responsible uh, regional uh, affairs in Middle East mm -hmm. and Africa for Cisco I'm very pleased to uh, invite uh, Mr. Hossein to make the presentation uh, about the mobile internet. So now I would like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Hossein to make, you, make uh, his uh, presentation, please. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, um, it's really a privilege and an honor to be on such a distinguished panel with, um, with your presence uh, and the presence of our distinguished speakers. Um, thank you for being here earlier in the morning. Uh, always a challenge to rise up early and be here before nine o'clock. Um, <clears throat> um, the, after the excellent presentation from um, um, China Telecom, um, uh, we have seen maybe a view from, from the Middle East and Africa and based, uh, based in Egypt. So I try to, um, to complement um, what was said with the, the, the regional view or um, uh, where, where we are, where, where I am based. Um, certainly, we, we have, have seen um, a tremendous growth in uh, IP traffic in general, and in particular mobile, mobile data traffic, uh, mobile broadband, um, throughout, uh, throughout the emerging markets and throughout the Middle East and Africa. Um, we, uh, our studies show that um, we expect at least 78% annual compounded growth between the year 2011 and 2016. And then by, <clears throat> by 2016, not only the traffic will have increased uh, so much fold, but actually the distribution of traffic will also be, be altered. And we have seen this change uh, in the last few, starting the last few years. Um, we see, we'll expect the uh, mobile video component to, mo to make more than half of the traffic, actually between 60 and 70 percent will be mobile video uh, traffic component. A very small portion of the traffic will be voice over <coughs> mobile voice over IP, and the <coughs> and the peer-to-peer -peer traffic will be even also as, uh, will also be a small a small portion. Of course, mobile gaming will be uh, uh, an important co uh, component of of uh, of the traffic. <coughs> um, we see a catalyst of the uh, important catalyst of the traffic growth is the availability of uh, of uh, smartphones um, uh, at at a more competitive prices um, and with with new generations of smartphones now we have the iPhone 5 and Samsung is certainly uh, getting its uh, market share uh, of, in, of smartphones that in some projections exceed that of, of, of Apple um, um, the use of smartphones becoming easier so we see the demographic of use also changing not only from adults but now more and more children are taking on 
the use of, of smartphones. Uh, 2G phones, simple touch phones were, are not sufficient anymore for, for our children. At the age of uh, 10 or even earlier, they are asking for a BlackBerry or, or a Samsung smartphone. Uh, and they know the model by, by name. So uh, I have two young children uh, at the age of uh, 13, so they are competing which model is best, and they want each one at his birthday to have a particular model. So very hard to satisfy. So these smartphones, um, ease of use is true, but also the traffic generation from these phones is, is much higher than conventional 2G phones, and this has an impact on the traffic growth that, 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 that we are seeing. Um, in the Middle East, as, as you know, we have undergone in the last uh, two years a tremendous change in, in uh, political environment with the Arab Spring and the revolutions that have taken place in several countries, starting by Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and uh, now in, in, in Syria. Um, these, um, these effects have also had an impact on the telecommunication scene, <clears throat> and we have seen traffic growth also um, associated uh, with these um, political movements and uh, uh, people movements. So we have seen traffic growth in excess of 40% in the days of the revolution, uh, primarily on, uh, on, 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 data, on data, data traffic, of course. Um, and after, after the revolution, when, they, when the services were, were returned, um, mobile uh, social media and mobile mobile traffic has seen between 40 and 50 percent increase in, video, in the video component. This increase in, in traffic is certainly um, um, <clears throat> a welcomed uh, a welcomed um, component from an operator perspective that the network is being more, more utilized. But it poses an inf uh, a challenge in terms of infrastructure. Um, not all the networks were geared to c to capture this amount of traffic. From the, from the cell site, backhauling it to the core network. And we see in some countries, uh, in, our, in our region, emerging markets and in the Middle East, um, that the, the fiber infrastructure is not adequate to carry that amount of traffic um, um, uh, in, with, a, with an acceptable uh, quality of service across the network. So certainly investment in infrastructure is, uh, is necessary to accommodate the 3G component of traffic, the video component of traffic, and to be ready for the 4G and LTE component of traffic. Um, as the projections for LTE say, that we uh, expect one session to uh, offer a bandwidth of 100 megabits per second download, uh, download rate. So that's significant amount of traffic per, per user, and networks have to be um, ramped up, more investment in infrastructure, particularly fiber to the cell site, to accommodate this kind of, of traffic growth. Uh, LTE has been uh, offered on a trial basis and in some cases on a commercial basis in some countries in the Gulf, um, um, uh, but not yet across, across the board in the Middle East um, to, for two main reasons. I mentioned one of them is the infrastructure availability. The second is the uh, unavailability availability of, of spectrum. So spectrum needs to be freed up to accommodate uh, spectrum beyond HSPA to that of, of LTE. <clears throat> um, we've, seen, we've seen also the, um, um, not only the, the growth in mobile traffic with, with licensed spectrum, but also with um, unlicensed spectrum, with Wi-Fi, with Wi-Fi services. Uh, we see the, what we call second generation of hotspots or carrier, carrier hotspot uh, services uh, becoming um, um, a widespread phenomena in, um, in emerging markets uh, or in developed countries as well but in emerging markets in particular for, um, for several reasons, including um, lack of spectrum, uh, licensed spectrum, so you go to the unlicensed one, and then for also to accommodate issues of coverage, where you have uh, lack of coverage or you have concentration of users, like in a stadium or a shopping center or a commercial district or business district. You can, instead of having extra towers to cover these with licensed spectrum coverage, you can have a Wi-Fi um, network of some sort, or a mesh network of some sort, to accommodate, aggregate the traffic, and then backhaul it to the uh, to the uh, mobile uh, mobile network. So this is um, a trend that we see now. Mobile operators um, in our region uh, very very interested in, and we see that growth in in, the, in terms of number of growth of in, um, in traffic on the Wi-Fi perhaps exceeding that in the, some of the 3G services. <clears throat> um, uh, I wanted to, to, to point out to one, one additional component is regarding when uh, youth uh, utilization of, uh, of mobile phones. Um, while we, of course, welcome the, um, the use of technology by, by, ev by everybody uh, using the Internet and uh, by youth in particular, 
uh, there's an aspect of uh, child, uh, child protection and making sure that children, while they have this technology at, at their fingertips and in privacy of their bedroom or, or classroom, that they don't um, uh, fall in the trap of having uh, to see um, uh, inappropriate content for, uh, for, for children. So the issue of child protection, particularly on, on mobile services, becomes um, a, critical, a critical issue. Um, we see um, some operators getting um, the, the, um, the, taking the initiative and having um, technological, technical solutions to, um, to block uh, indecent content once the, it's identified that the user is uh, a child. And this is something that can be communicated um, when you subscribe to the service or, the, or when the parent subscribes to the service, like identify in the household he has this, this number of youngsters. And then in this case, the operator has the information to block indecent content for this particular uh, young, um, young user. But it comes, uh, it, can, it can be done, of course, on a fixed uh, network, a fixed broadband, but also becomes even more critical on, on the mobile broadband because the nature of the, of the device and the privacy um, uh, where the child uses it uh, under, not under supervision of, uh, of an adult. Um, yeah, these are the key, the key uh, points I wanted to raise, and certainly during the discussion, perhaps we can raise some other, uh, other points. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hossain. The, as you know, the Cisco is a major provider for uh, all the network equipment, uh, including all the developing countries. Uh, may I ask a uh, uh, doctor question now? The, uh, last year, I met uh, one uh, chief scientist from Cisco in Beijing. Uh, he said, the uh, Cisco is uh, annually uh, uh, published one so-called visual uh, network index uh, reports. Yes. Uh, you just uh, mentioned uh, some traffic uh, records or travel uh, estimation is uh, from these reports. Yes. Um, uh, thank you, um, Dr. Zah uh, Mr. Chairman, for bringing this up. Yes, indeed, the, uh, you are on the spot. The uh, numbers I mentioned are published in what we call the fish, um, Visual Networking Index, or short VNI, Visual Networking Index. It's an annual report that Cisco publishes, has been publishing for the last um, uh, three to four years, um, which has an estimation for traffic growth um, related to the, to the Internet, so fixed traffic, mobile traffic, now we have also a cloud index, how, how we see cloud services being adopted, and also an IPv6, uh, IPv6 index yeah. to see how IPv6 is being rolled out and the effect of machine-to-machine um, -machine communication and, and smart devices on IPv6 uh, deployment. So yeah. certainly uh, that's the source of information, and I welcome all of you to, to look at it. It's on the public website of Cisco. The buzzword is, or the keyword is VNI. Uh, VNI is available on your uh, website? Yes, on the public website, cisco.com. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm. Uh, I would like to invite uh, my third speaker on my list. He's uh, from China. Uh, he's from Baidu. You know Baidu is a leading company for search engine services in China. Uh, it's Mr. Zhao Chen. Uh, he is responsible for the public and the government affairs for Beidou companies. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Zhao Chen make presentation, please. Uh, Mr. President Gao, thank you for your kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. <coughs> I'm very honored to be here to attend this meeting to share some points of view on the mobile internet market in China. Uh, first, I should say, I'm very sorry, since I can't code several days ago, maybe I can't help coping during my speech. If I do so, please pardon me. In China, shipments of smartphones have... In China, shipments of smartphones have long since passed shipments in the United States. The strategy analytics has forecast that Smartphone shipments will reach 150 million units in China by the end of this year, a 70% increase year on year. They put 2,012 shipments in the United States at 
and the 23 meeting. Smartphone will only continue to become more ubiquitous. Prices on mobile phones fell dramat dramatically just last year. Sub 1,000 yuan smartphones with good touch screen handsets at under 150 US dollars are offered under many brand names now in China. According to the latest Scenic V, in 2012, for the first time, a greater percentage of Chinese respondents said they use their mobile phones to access internet than either notebook computers or desktops. Then, what's Baidu's way? In 2009, Baidu box computing set off on the road towards creating a new paradigm in search, turning the search box into a new powerful command box. For much We have come a long way since then. I'm glad to see we are more confident than ever about our vision in, for search and how it will play out, not just on the PC-based internet, but even more importantly, on mobile. The Baidu search box brings hundreds of millions of users precisely what they are looking for and delivers it directly to their search results page. Whether they are searching for strategy structured data like a train or air tickets, digital contents like books, or even applications. And we are more closer each day to putting a search powered box at the center of smartphone experience. For most for much of our history, Baidu has been a very product-focused company. We create and continue to operate some of the Chinese Internet's best loved and most widely used products. And that has been fundamental to our success as a company. Search, different verticals like image, video, music search, maps, and, of course, our community products like Baidu Post Bar, Baidu Nose, and Baidu Encyclopedia. What role will big companies like Baidu place in the ecosystem of the mobile internet? Today, I want to talk about how we see the mobile internet shaping up and the role that big companies like Baidu will play in the emerging ecosystem of the mobile web. How we are le le leveraging our strengths to win the future in the mobile internet. We have always been a platform company in another important ways as a platform for enterprises to reach customers. On any basis, we have, we have half a million customers on our search marketing platform. Most of those are SMEs, small and medium enterprises. The number may seem like a lot, but keep in mind that there are many SMEs, over 40 million SMEs in China. So there is still an enormous potential market that we haven't tapped. And our customers are by no means limited to SMEs. We are also a platform for major brands, both Chinese and international, to reach customers with their brand messages. Tough in familiar brand name 
like Barbary, a coach, a channel, a painting. And you can see an ad format that we call brand link, something that many brands find very effective at bridging the gap between display and performance-based marketing. Baidu will, of course, continue to be the best platform for webmasters and for enterprises alike. But today, I would talk about Baidu becoming a platform company. What I'm really meaning is, Baidu is becoming a platform for APP developers. By many measures, Baidu is a large company. In our 12 years in operation, we have grown to a company with over 18,000 employees, with the largest and most powerful national wide network of any Chinese internet company. We are an innovative company, and we will always strive to remain so. Just in September, Forbes magazine named Baidu as the most innovative company in Asia, coming at number five out of 100 global companies. Baidu continues to invest heavily in cloud computing infrastructure. As you may have read, we are now building what will be China's most advanced RDC. It's a construction in Shanxi province. And we have two other RDC and construction in other provinces. But we want to innovate in areas where we can really leverage our strengths as a company, areas where our position as a dominant search player, where the scale of our, inf of our infrastructure network and where our research and development com capabilities in core technologies can all be brought to bear. Over the following year, we will take it a step further, returning content like ebooks, music, and online video that a user could consume directly from their search result page. More exciting still is the addition of applications. In September 2010, we formally opened up our platform for third-party APP developers. And before long, we have tens of thousands of cloud-based web APPs you could put up and use just by typing C scientific calculators, or plans verse zoom bias into your search box. Now we begin to provide developing environment for APP developers. In short, Baidu want to empower developers so that they are limited only by their own, imagina their own imagination. We want to save them time, money, and hassle so that they can focus on what they do best, innovation. What Baidu ends in this? Naturally, we want to be the dominant mobile internet ecosystem in China. Our mobile terminal alliance already covers almost every handset brand selling in China. This relationship have already made Baidu the default search provider are over 80% of Android-based smartphone brands sold in China. As more and more harnesses powered by our Baidu Cloud mobile platform will come out on the market, will come out, out on the market, we believe the Baidu Cloud ecosystem will be quickly recognized as the best choice for Chinese smartphones users. So, what does the future of the mobile internet look like? Baidu says the native APP gradually 
being supplanted with cloud-based APPs. After all, why should the heavy computational lifting happen on our handsets? When that requires powerful processors and significant storage, that should be happening in massive data centers. In the meantime, we believe that the search will be in the center of the mobile experiences. People will use search by text or increasingly by voice commander, not only to look for information, content, or APPs from the web, but also to activate native APPs. This is already happening, and we have made great strides in the, in the integration of the search box into many other basic handsets functions. Semantically intelligent, smarter, and more powerful search will, I believe, make the operating system as we know it a thing of the past. This, our, this is all my points of view on the Chinese mobile uh, internet. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for Mr. Zhao your, for your excellent presentation. I saw the some uh, remote participants uh, they would like to ask something. Yeah, please. No, no worries, no worries. Now? Yeah, okay. Okay. So the first question is, we know that mobile come with issue like security, and what are the measurements taken by your companies to ensure security of users? You ask uh, Beidou? I'm asking the uh, all, all the, all the yes. speakers, okay? Yeah. Okay. If you can answer. And the second one is, what is ADP? Uh. What is ADP? APP and ADP. APP? APP. ADP. Uh, ADP. ADP, what is, what is it means ADP? I think you mentioned ADP. Huh? APP, which is application. A APP, no, no, ADP. I didn't hear ADP. Yeah. Uh, okay, then what about the first question? Yeah, first question. Maybe, maybe uh, Dr. Koshan? Please. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so yeah, certainly the issue of, of, of security is a, is a very critical issue. It's also a very complex one. Uh, it has several, several layers that can, that can be implemented in and can be addressed at. But perhaps from, from the, uh, and so the question is concerned about the user uh, privacy and the private information not being shared to, uh, to un, uh, unwanted um, destinations. Um, certainly the operator has the responsibility to make sure that all information is, um, is um, shared uh, in, in confidence and is not uh, allowed to, to be um, sent or shared um, for marketing or other purposes. Uh, in this case, it's not really the, the mobile operator per se, but the content provider is more the one that has most information. A content provider or over-the-top operators, uh, those are the ones who have more information than the, than the local um, service operator. Uh, and um, it's certainly a concern, and um, um, many entities, um, either uh, national or regional, are working on the, um, some sort of code of conduct or privacy uh, rules that will be implemented um, regionally and nationally um, and agreed upon between the different constituents so that user uh, privacy is, is maintained. So certainly an important issue and requires uh, cooperation from uh, different uh, stakeholders. Okay. You have a question? Yeah, okay, please. Uh, this is uh, Faisal Hassan from uh, ISOC Bangladesh. Uh, I have a question about the IPv6 uh, status of China Telecom. Like, what's the situation? What are you doing with the IPv6? Mm. Because it's very important for us. Thank you. Mm. IPv6. 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 Yeah, okay. Mr. Liu, if yeah. you will answer. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we have we have a contact with IPv6 uh, national backbone work, uh, network experience for more than three years. And I think maybe next year uh, our backbone network will, will introduce the IPv6 network. 
I, I think uh, the uh, just a moment, John, please, just a moment. I think uh, IPv6 uh, uh, program in China also uh, is already the end of the way. I think in the next five years we will speed up. Uh, but uh, I think it's the most important factor for speed of the uh, IPv6 uh, applications is uh, incentives, yeah, profit incentives. Uh, otherwise, is, I think uh, only government efforts is uh, not enough. Yeah, it's my opinion. Thank you. Okay, please. Thank you. I'm uh, Nabil uh, Benamar uh, from Morocco, ISOC Morocco, and I am ISOC ambassador this year. So, my question is to Mr. Hussein. Uh, as you know, uh, one of the main goals of uh, IGF is access. So, and since uh, we, are, we are in the, the era of uh, mobile access to internet, so no one are uh, talking about and raise the problem of the, the, the fees of uh, mobile uh, phones and smartphones and uh, how we can guarantee this, uh, this access to, to internet with this huge cost of uh, smartphones actually. Like uh, we are, you have said uh, about uh, iPhones uh, and uh, Samsung and the others. So the question is for all the panelists, how we can raise this problem, how we can solve this problem, because this is the main problem actually to mobile internet. The fees of uh, smartphones are very high. And since uh, in Africa we are rising in this, we are leading in this problem, in this, in this, uh, yeah, we are, we are the leaders actually in the mobile access to internet with using smartphones. However, we still have a, a, a high cost. I don't know about uh, China, uh, how is it uh, the question? My, my, my second uh, question is about IPv6. Do you have an IPv6 native IPv6 in China? Is it dual stack? In, uh, for end user, do you uh, can you provide IPv4 and IPv6 addresses to your uh, end users? Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, you have uh, two questions. Maybe first question, maybe Dr. Hossein, you make a response. Sure. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for for the question. <laughs> Uh, I, ag I agree with you that um, at, at the moment the, the price of a, a smartphone uh, is um, is quite su substantial, and um, to to um, to, really to reach the kind of level of penetration that that we expect and that we hope, the price has to uh, to be reduced uh, significantly. Uh, I believe there are efforts underway to uh, to come up with models that are maybe not not as uh, as uh, rich in functionality but have some fundamental functions that users are looking for and have quite um, a quite price range people are talking at uh, about 50 to 100 dollars should, should be a good a good uh, price price range um, and i think the co competition here is is the keyword the more competition you have the the lower the price will be uh, and we have huge markets like for example in in china and uh, or in india and i think this is also the places where things will start to see as we have seen in the automobile industry we have cars that are less than a thousand dollars so we can expect to see in the near future hopefully uh, mobile phone sets that are between fifty hundred dollars i know that this challenge was put at the last mobile world congress in barcelona in last february uh, some of the CEOs of the leading uh, operators have raised this issue, as, as you have just mentioned. And I think there was a consensus that we need to have an industry that aims at having smartphones in the range of 50 to $100. So I, 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 think, I don't think it's in the far future. I think it will happen quite uh, soon, inshallah. Dr. Kosen, you, you mentioned uh, 50, 50 to 100 is the uh, price of smartphone or is, uh, is access fee? No, I believe the question was on the price of the phone set. Phone set? The phone set. Oh. Yes. Correct. Phone yeah. set. Yeah. Yes. You know, uh, I, I think in China, w we already have uh, uh, nearly uh, 200 US dollars smartphone. Very popular. Very cheap. Yes. And the quality is no, uh, I think, uh, it can compar com comparable with the uh, iPhone. Yeah, uh, six question I ask Mr. Liu, I'll make an answer. Yeah, just in fact, uh, I, I want to say the, the mobile uh, smartphones really, uh, we introduce a lot of the 
100 smartphones for 3G. You know, it's really incredible. Just the figure I mentioned for in September, one month, we have more than 10 million 3G network access to the to the our network. So the handset really in China is very cheap now. Uh, 200, uh, 100, 200, you know, a lot of popular uh, handset. About just you mentioned about IP6, I see. Yes, I really agree. You know, we have the two stack, IP4, IPv4, IP, IPv6. And now we really introduce a lot of the new applications such as M2M application using IPv6. And then we, we will cooperate with our uh, application provider to, uh, to, to let them to introduce IPv6 application. So the two step. Okay. Uh, I, I would like to sorry to say we have a last speaker. So all the comments and the question after all the presentation make finish. You know? Okay, thank you. Then I would like to ask uh, 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 Mr. Paul Michel from uh, Microsoft uh, make a last uh, presentation, please. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. My colleagues have done a nice job of explaining that growth is happening, there's technical changes happening. I'd like to give you a little bit of a different frame to think about the challenges that we face. In 1877, Thomas Edison invented the phonograph. What he was trying to do was find a way to transcribe telegraphic messages onto paper tape, and he figured out how the vibrations in a diaphragm could be turned into indentations on a cylinder. He was always creative, and he came up with 10 uses for the device. Among those uses were the teaching of elocution, the family record, a registry of sayings, reminiscences, etc. Clocks that could announce and articulate speech at the time for going home, going to meals, etc. And educational purposes such as preserving the explanations made by a teacher so that a pupil could refer to them at any moment and spelling or other lessons placed upon the phonograph for convenience in committing to memory. Those are all his words, not mine. He tried for years to find a successful business model, but he failed. It actually took someone else, Emil Berliner, who was the co-founder of the Victor Talking Machine Company, to improve on his invention and create the home music industry, beginning in 1901 with the introduction of the Victrola. The 1,000 songs in your pocket that was introduced by Apple in 2001 was a long time in coming. Brilliant as he was, Edison did not have the vision or the foresight to imagine the home entertainment revolution. Up to that time, home entertainment consisted of people making their own music at home, playing the piano, singing, etc. Going to concerts to experience live music was the only alternative. Change the scene. In April 1912, an unimaginable tragedy took place. 1,517 people lost their lives as the Titanic sank. So, why did they die? At least one theory says it wasn't that the ship sank. It was due to incompatible radio equipment and spectrum usage among ships. The Californian was only five miles away. It could easily have reached the passengers in time to save them, but it could not hear the Titanic's distress call. So in the wake of that event, the world's first radio regulators vowed that it would not happen again, and they created what we now know as the radio regulations. That was a remarkable achievement, especially when considered from this point a century later. later. That system brought us safe marine and air navigation systems, AM and FM radio, high-definition digital television sets, space satellite communications, baby monitors, microwave ovens, garage door openers, Wi-Fi, and, of course, mobile telephone service. So, what do these two events have in common with today's topic? Mobile is changing the world, the challenges and opportunities. First, the story of the phonograph highlights the importance of vision in imagining a new business. 
Berliner's idea ultimately came, became a multi-billion dollar global phenomena that helped to shrink the world, introducing people to cultural experiences they never otherwise would have had access to. It ultimately created the idea of the hit. It made recording artists household names. And it created an entirely new category of jobs and skills in the production, marketing, and distribution of recorded music, and ultimately later of recorded video. That legacy lives on today, but now it's in a new form, and it has new challenges. It's the digital music world of iTunes on the iPhone, Xbox Music on Windows Phone, and a collection of marketplaces for Android phones. From the vantage point today, it's difficult to imagine how groundbreaking the idea of the recorded music and home entertainment industry was in 1901. Perhaps it was a bit like trying to imagine today's mobile devices 50 years ago. Not many people could. The technology itself was not enough. Edison failed, but the environment in which Edison and Berliner lived fa facilitated discovery and innovation. Now, the Titanic story highlights the critical role of enabling regulation, especially in industries like wireless communication. It also so shows the stimulating effect that great tragedy historically has had on societies. The people who created the first enabling radio regulations were groundbreaking. They had to balance the known technology against the goals of national sovereignty and life safety, and they had to provide enough flexibility to enable further innovation in the future when they couldn't foresee what the technology would become. While that system was state of the art when it was developed a century ago, it's anything but today. And we all need to change it, and we do need to change it soon. Because as all of you are aware, we're now hooked on being connected, although perhaps not so easily here in this room today. But we're, we want to be connected to our families and friends connected to our workplaces and connected to the world at large, and that is all about mobile. So our current spectrum allocation system is a bit like a parking garage where all the parking spaces are reserved, but they're empty most of the time. Unfortunately, only those with reservations can use the spaces. Over time, our spectrum allocation system will need to change to enable those parking spaces to be dynamically allocated. This will be critical to address the long-term challenges of enabling more global wireless connectivity. As radio regulators start thinking about the next iteration of the radio regulations, enabling this dynamic allocation should be one of those discussion topics. The broad challenge and opportunity for mobile ultimately is to reach the world affordably, which was raised just a moment ago. For nearly 4 billion of the world's population, broadband is in any form is unaffordable. And as was recently mentioned, we need to bring costs down. If we can bring costs down, we will get three benefits. First, there will be more participants in the ecosystem as a whole, which directly contributes to continued lower costs. Second, there will be more incentives to invest on the part of service providers because of the lowered costs and fewer barriers to entry, as well as the greater customer potential. And third, if history is any guide, we will see significant increases in overall GDP, especially in developing countries, as we're ultimately able to move closer to achieving the UN's Millennium Development Goals for broadband. But to achieve this, we need to think beyond today's businesses and imagine a different future in the same way that Emil Berliner did with the Victor Victrola. Our future is framed by our past, but ultimately not limited by it. We need enlightened, flexible regulation, especially around spectrum, which is critical for mobile. The regulators that created the first radio regulations following the Titanic disaster left a substantial legacy. But that model needs to change to take advantage of advances in technology. So in closing, I'll note that we are in the midst of a substantial shift in telecommunications, especially mobile. We're moving into a world where everything is just an application on the internet accessible through a wide range of devices, including PCs, tablets, mobile handsets, and things we haven't thought of yet. As a society, we need to be respectful of the rich history, but focused on the future as we seek to enable the broadest possible opportunities. So, thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, <laughs> Paul.
you gave us a very interesting story <laughs> and a very very excellent presentation yeah very convinced I now uh, want to open the floor for discussion and comments uh, but uh, because the time is very limited so I ask uh, uh, everyone to shoot your question and uh, focus your questions please yeah, please no, no voice, no voice. Thank you. Yeah, My okay. name is John Laprise. I'm a professor at Northwestern University in Qatar. Uh, I also serve as a consulting scholar to ICT Qatar, which is the uh, regulatory and ICT policy entity there. I am not speaking on their behalf today. Um, I would just like to say that the, this panel has been great. Um, one factor that we find in Qatar, which uh, having smartphone adoption upwards of 100% and having essentially, you know, my students have unlimited broadband packages, which is the norm. The, the problem we find, or one of the big problems we find, is not so much in local connection, although that's a challenge too at times, but it's the international connection. It's the submarine cables because the students are accessing sites abroad and that relies on the submarine infrastructure, fiber infrastructure. So as as much as we want to focus on accessibility via wireless, we also have to pay attention to more traditional long distance access means um, because that's a major hindrance uh, and cost add for many parts of the world is just getting access to the content that you want, not through the local, but through the international. Thank you. Uh, I think it is, it is a very difficult question. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, Maybe Mr. Liu, you, no, you, you have. It's not. He, I, I don't think he's has me. Just mentioned. No. We should pay attention to the long haul uh, internet connection, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. You, you, you have. Oh, okay. You can be. <coughs> Actually, <coughs> um, I just wanted to uh, give a comment and answer to the, to the question. Excellent question. <clears throat> yeah, certainly uh, international capacity is, um, is, is, is a problem, uh, not only in the Middle East, but, but, um, but everywhere in Africa and everywhere uh, else. But I, I don't think we should only focus on resolving the issue through increased international capacity. I think another dimension we should also consider is moving content that's outside to, um, to be local content. And as much as possible, having that mirrored here and then um, and that, uh, access through an, a, a local connection instead of an international connection. Um, content that's generated in the Middle East should remain in the Middle East, hosted here and not hosted outside, and as much as possible have mirrors from the over-the-top of the content providers in our region. Submarine cables are also ne certainly a necessity to make this happen, but we should go in parallel. Thank you. Uh, yeah, please. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mikhail Kamarov. I represent here National Research University High School of Economics uh, from Moscow, Russia, and also head of R&D Lab and Telecommunications. I have one question, uh, probably you know, to all the participants. What do you think about Web 3.0 concept and uh, how it grows and how it's integrating into our, our life? How it would influence on the, you know, on the mobile telecommunications itself and on mobile operators probably in terms of connecting not just uh, human beings, but all the things are, you know, uh, to the internet, right? Thank you very much. The internet of things. <laughs> yeah, uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, for China Telecom, we just pay attention to the, the development of Web3, Web3. Point, uh, but anyway, we, we, we can see that now with more and more business model, are developed, the new technology really, I, I just mentioned, you know, become more and more popular. A lot of the small enterprises, they want to introduce this application, then they, they can, they can upward, upload to, you know, to, uh, to, the, to the operator or the, to the even the iPhone application, you know, APP store. You know, so I think it's, it's really a very good, you know, the, I mean the customer sized applications is the trend. So that's why the Web 3.0 is maybe the next technology. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Paul, you have some? 
it is missing. Yeah, so the the Internet of Things or uh, sensor networks, machine to machine, whichever terms you want uh, uh, to to use, I think is is clearly the next thing in in. Um, the past year, one of the things Microsoft has been involved in has been a trial of a, a broad, uh, unlicensed wireless technology in um, in Cambridge, the UK, which we ran for about a year. And part of that trial was uh, a network of of sensors controlling a wide range of things, including when a particular trash can would be picked up by the by the trash collectors. Uh, when, when we look at the economic impact of being able to, with a, a device that costs less than a dollar that will last for 10 years, which is the, the trajectory for these types of sensors, when we can replace, um, replace those sensors in all kinds of service capacities that currently are causing us to use energy and use human capital to perform tasks that are not required, uh, we actually have the ability to then move all of that you know, human resource off into into other things, and I think that's one of the great dividend benefits that we get. That's not actually talked about very much. It's about being able to move the 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 human resource capital and intellectual capital away from doing menial things that do not need to be done, uh, and and let the intelligent system sort of take care of that, and then and then we focus the energy on something else. Uh. I, I think the one gentleman he raised the question about the uh, security issues on the uh, internet, uh, mobile internet. Uh, may I introduce you all the audience? It's a very famous uh, Chinese company. It's a 360 company. Uh, they, we, we have invited the vice chairman of the 360 companies who is a, a major uh, security service provider uh, in China, um, uh, Mrs. Chu Bing. Now I want uh, uh, Chu Bing make some uh, short presentation. Thanks, Ms. Gao, and uh, thanks, uh, everybody. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm come from a uh, Chinese company. Uh, we are the uh, biggest uh, secu security company in China. So I would like to share some information about our company with, with us, with you, and then I would like to uh, give you some figures. Maybe it's easy and uh, very simply to understand and uh, remember my company. And Tihu uh, is the least uh, company on the uh, New York Stock Exchange on March last year. And we have some figures. The, the one figure is number two. And we are the second largest com uh, Chinese internet, uh, internet company in user in China. And that figure is number one. Uh, we are the number one internet security company in China because we have uh, the 425 million active service users. And another number one is um, uh, internet mobile security company in China. We are so happy we have 60% uh, uh, um, the rating that uh, mobile company, uh, mobile security industry in China. And that uh, last uh, number one is um, Brazer, uh, Brazer com uh, market share in China uh, because we have 62% uh, user penetration rate. And we will, uh, I would like to share the, our uh, product and uh, uh, service in the internet uh, industry. You know, we are the, f uh, the largest uh, internet security company and we have the 94% uh, 
read in the PC internet industry in China. And now we will. Li I like to share the mobile phone safeguard because we have the largest. Uh, we are the largest. Uh, the mobile phone sa safeguard road in China, and. It's very interesting and easy to understand when you use our product. Example: uh, We have the the mobile safeguard, uh, safeguard is a different uh, a segment. Example: The mobile safe skin is very easy to use and uh, protect your um, a policy or your some message and uh, other. Other thing is the data protection, and you can provide information hiding and anti safety protection. And the other one is killing. Uh, everybody knows uh, killing the uh, is the same the uh, anti virus. And the other one is battery management. You can know when your battery is very very sh short. Or you should uh, give some of the uh, battery the the safe and mode on click. And uh, I would like to show the other is mobile browser. Uh, mobile browser is very useful because when you use the smartphone and you have to. Uh, uh, on the uh, you have to using the internet or make some the messages. So when you use the uh, smartphone and you just the uh, first time you to use mobile brushes, and uh, I think we I the product uh, product is um, very useful. And easy to to control it. So, I think we are the new company, and uh, we have uh, opportunity to uh, to uh, cooperate with the the foreigner company and uh, other Chinese company. We will, uh, we are so happy, and uh, we we go in very quickly. So thank you. Thank you. I. I think uh, I want to audience to ask the last question. Are there some uh, questions or comments? Oh, okay. Uh, please, please. Yeah. Huh? Oh. Um, I'm Ayman Salah. I'm from the uh, International Center for Journalists, and my question will be very brief. Don't you think, as a, the big players in the market of communication, that the idea of YMAX in rural areas might help to bring down the cost of communication and make the content more accessible to users? Thank you. Dr. Hain? Dr. Hain? Yeah. YMAX. Yes, yes, true. Sure. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> yes, certainly, <clears throat> WiMAX as a technology had its, uh, its peak maybe three or four years ago in terms of uh, market acceptance, matur maturity, and deployment. Uh, but yes, for sure, it still has a room for, for, um, to be deployed uh, as a complement to, uh, to uh, licensed or unlicensed um, uh, mobile technologies. Um, by all means, either a point-to-point -point, um, technology or a point-to-multipoint technology. Both of them are, are adequate. It becomes only a matter of availability of spectrum, and here the five gigahertz may be the easiest to use because it's unlicensed, uh, as well as the issue of mobility has to be dealt with in regards to the existing mobile operators. But for sure, yes, it has a, still has a room to play. Thank you. Thank you. Last question, okay, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am Elchim Mamadov, Institute of Information Technologies in Azerbaijan. At first, thank you for this great presentation and welcome to Azerbaijan. So my question is about Baidu. Uh, 
So uh, do you have any cooperation with uh, academic institutions? And uh, for example, do you have uh, like uh, applications for digital libraries? More about uh, if you have, of course, uh, some digital library applications that users can use them uh, like academically. Um, maybe it's like free, you, free charge or the, uh, it's commercial ideas. Little bit about this. Thank you. Yep, Mr. Zhao, uh, the Suzhou mm. Tourism uh, Now uh, we we have some products just like uh, digital library, uh, side, um, uh, some products like a digital museum, and we are also prepared to buy some. Uh, Patent uh, digital uh, documents uh, for users to retrieve and use. Okay. That's a free use or you have some commercial sites? No, no, no voice, please. No voice. Okay, sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, do, that's your resources, that's information, that uh, free charge or with commercial, you have some commercial sites. It's free charge like by Like databases, now. scientific databases. It's, fr it's free charge by now. It's free by now. It's free. For now. now. Yeah, it's free. So you, you have some information uh, in like it, another site that we can access, like we can use like this part of the world, use these resources or it's all in Chinese, or you have international resources in English, in other languages? But now we are mainly uh, Chinese uh, resources, and it's free for users. But some resources, we also paid for it. You pay for it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, you have some URL address or uh, announcement about your digital library that who interested, uh, get information actually, who interested in your digital library, what you have. Where can we get information about that? That about your digital library? Uh, uh, we have no, uh, uh, we have no statement. Uh, we have no statement open to the uh, public by now. Mm -hmm. But we uh, 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 pre uh, we make some preparation. You you're still uh, working on it, or I'm still working on it, but not uh, deliver to public by now. Ah, it's not accessible for public now, for now. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think the workshop, well, our workshop uh, should be closed. Oh, what, what is it? There, there are some uh, remote uh, participants. Please. So, do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, question to the panel: There is information circulating on the verb in some countries, which want to, uh, the internet service to be categorized by some operations. This means that depending on the type of content, the price will change. Don't you think that a such decision would reduce the suspension of mobile internet? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Paul. I'm not sure I could fully understand the question, but if the idea is that um, the internet service itself becomes uh, fractured, so that you know there's instead of the internet service, there's the word document service, the email service, the music service. I think that's a detriment to the entire um, you know future evolution of the internet. What makes the internet as as exciting and vibrant as it is is that it is a neutral platform that allows any type of content to flow freely as long as it does not harm the network itself. And that ultimately is, the, is I think, uh, what needs to happen. Now that said, I don't think there's anything wrong with people exploring new types of business models and different ways to offer services as long as doing so does not violate those fundamental principles of, of uh, you know, essentially uh, ease of access and sort of free flow of all the content. That that wants to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no. No more question from remote. Okay. Uh, okay. We uh, we close uh, the workshop. I would like to thank uh, all the speakers uh, for your com contribution.
and also I want to thank to all the audience present here. And uh, I would like to announce to the because uh, when gentlemen ask you uh, digital library uh, questions, uh, this afternoon we will uh, chair one workshop. And uh, in which room? Yeah. Uh, uh, room room four. Yeah? Room a uh, room three. Room three. Uh, they they will be uh, topic on the open knowledge environment. I think it's a digital library. It's a topic one. So uh, welcome all the audience participants. Another uh, workshop. Then thanks. Ah, uh, time. Uh, it's two thirty. Two thirty. Ah, room three. Room three. Please remember. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thanks again. Thank you.